Good morning, everybody. Everybody happy? We'll fix that. Good. So I was asked by Wells some time ago. He said, you're an eccentric. Um, why don't you do some eccentric turning? So how could I you know, not take up that challenge? Um, I am Martin Meerman. Thank you. Um, well, so it says I'm a rocket scientist. I think I'm more a rocket engineer because as an engineer, you actually have to build stuff that works. Whereas a scientist, not as bad as a mathematician, <laughs> a mathematician only has to prove that it doesn't work. And therefore, whatever he didn't do may actually work, but that's not his problem. <laughs> Eccentric wood turning is a dangerous thing from an aesthetic point of view. The reason that we like wood turning and the reason that wood turned items are pretty and have been seen as pretty for thousands of years is because our brain is completely set up and has developed over the millions of years to find wood turning pretty. <laughs> And the reason that we find it pretty is that any wood turning has two things. On the one hand, it has absolute symmetry. By definition, you turn something and it gets complete symmetry. And we find that things that are symmetric are pretty. Whereas, if you ever were Donald Duck, things that are not symmetric are not pretty. Right? The bad guy in the Mickey Mouse movies always has an unsymmetrical face. And we find symmetrical things nice. The other thing that wood turning does, it gives us a nice flowing force that are at the same time nice and flowing and completely symmetrical. So to show you the wood turning equivalent of that, <laughs> one ugly piece of eccentric, off-axis, wood turned ugliness. So if you're turning something that looks like that, it's a bit like when you have a famous person who has this mouth that goes over here, but he sometimes manages to turn it into this smirk that people find interesting. And it's that trick that we have to get into it. Because at the same time, certain things are pretty and symmetrical. Audrey Hepburn, has a special place. She's from Holland. We <laughs> didn't know that. And I'm from Holland. So there you go. What happened to you? Yeah, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to you? <laughs> I live in hope. So here we can say that. Back in BC, if you said that, well, you don't live in hope. That's a bit just inland a little bit from Vancouver. Time called hope. There we always say, yeah, you can always live in hope because that's not expensive to live there. It's a bit here like saying, you can always live in Stockholm. Um, anyway, if you take a person like Audrey Hepburn and you analyze her innards, and as wood turners, we're allowed to do that. <laughs> You see that actually, even though she is perfectly symmetrical, when she stands, she kind of gets that just additional piece of perfection into it. It's like any handmade item. Now, if you want something perfect, if you want a perfect bowl, 
You know, people ask me for a perfect bowl, go to IKEA, that's 10 bucks and comes with a warranty. If you want a handmade piece that is only one off, that has to, just a little bit of off, just to make sure that it is perfect and that everybody likes it, and it's a one off and it's personal to you, you made it for another person. Anyway, Audrey Hepburn, of course, knew exactly how to do that. And you then look at the various axes that are in there and transcribe those onto a piece of wood. Because as a wood turner, you can make anything. I remember when I was this little and the latest toy came out, my first thought was always, ah, how can I make one of these myself? Never, I need to get an uncle to get me for my birthday or I need to ask my parents for one, or I need to get some money to go buy someone. That somehow that never came in it for me. I always wanted to make it myself. And it rarely worked, but if you're trying to make a copy of Audrey Hepburn, in ever so slightly off-center mode, by essentially copying these various axes onto a piece of wood. I now have my own version of like a cut. Hey, Marty. Um, when it's not symmetric, it's asymmetric. And given her as an example, she wouldn't be able to stand if another part of her body didn't compensate on the other side, thus making it balanced. And that makes it acceptable. There you go. Balancing it out is one way to fix an eccentric problem. If you, um, and John Wells, where did you go? No, you're a Welsh shoemaker, John Wells. Well, the, the real ah, the real yeah, behind, behind the He's just hiding behind it. What did I do? He is. <laughs> you made many eccentrically turned wine goblets. Yes. Yeah. Right. But nobody would buy those if they couldn't actually stand up. If they would just fall over, they wouldn't be much good. So even though you're trying to make an eccentric, multi-axis turned, you still have to make them balanced. And that then kind of brings them back into something that people can see some amazement, like, hey, this thing can actually stand up. How does that work? And that is then where the craftsmanship of John comes into play to make it into something that is actually nice and pretty and useful. Not that this is useful for anything other than for explaining that even Rocket scientists sometimes real, realize that, no, actually they're not rocket scientists. <laughs> I must also admit that at some point, many years ago, um, in the you know, rocket scientists versus brain surgeons, I mean, brain surgery is not rocket science, is it? <laughs> um, but in the final of the you know, smartest people of the UK, Two neurologists apparently beat the two, um, the two rocket scientists, rocket engineers. In the other, I was one of that rocket science team. Um, but the jury decided that the neurologist made a better mess up of the whole thing. The task that we set, like you know, use a photocopier and crap like that. Um, but it made fun late night viewing for some people. But anyway, people that make that are not exactly rocket scientists. On the other hand. I made this in Emerald. So. <laughs> you tell me. There are a number of things that you call off axis. One of them is, for instance, an emerging ball. Anybody ever made an emerging ball? Where you turn it, and as it turns, you have to pull back your. <laughs> no, 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 no. Tool all the time to make sure that you only cut this half of it and not that half of it. <laughs> or, what you could also do, apparently, is go for the multi axis approach where you have a square block, you turn out the inside here, and then you 
glue another piece of wood onto it, and then it looks like that, a bit thicker obviously, and then you can turn it like that, and out comes this shape, and then you get the table saw out and you get rid of this. You then hope that you glued it exactly and that the wall thickness is even either side. And if you look carefully, you will see that, no, that's been quite worked out this time. Well, at least close enough, I didn't cut through the ends. And that's the important bit. But that slight offset, that slight inaccuracy, makes this one-off that didn't come from Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read, by the way, Ikea has just announced a new method of putting furniture together, where essentially the number of screws goes from like 150 for a copper down to 20 or so. That it's all connected, and you take your billy, you put the back up, and then you fold the two faces out, and you fold the front bit down, and then you have a couple of screws to put it together. Instead of getting all the sides and all the pins and all the screws and everything. So everybody here who prides themselves on being able to put IKEA stuff together, you know, with one hand tied behind the back in the dark while somebody's harassing them because you know, we all class people and it's an excellent way of you know getting around student digs, helping out all these poor people that don't know how to put IKEA furniture together. That will no longer be a valuable trait as of a few days ago. <laughs> I've heard that's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, news, news travel fast. News travel fast. Mark, do you want me to circulate this? Pardon? Do you want me to circulate this? Yeah, sure. People want to see it up close. Do not get too close to it. So, another way of doing offset is the more winchy stuff. Anybody ever heard of Mark's theory? Mark Sferi, he's a famous turner. I had to bring something small, right? So he made a whole series of baseball bats. And this is one of them, where you can see the ball was kind of a bit too heavy for the bat to right, right through it. And you can see that, of course, this being wood turned, it has to go off several axes in order to turn that. Now, this turning, is a two-axis, what I call a V-turn. And a V-turn is one that looks like this. So you have a piece of wood. Imagine there's wood here. Inside that wood, there's an axis. There's actually two axes. But they coincide on one side, and on the other side, there are two points. And that means that if you start turning by holding it on this end, it starts to swing around, around the first axis. And I realized after I made these, I should have made those bits of wood stick through, but I'll fix them at some point. I was, I was out at a conference for a while, and I didn't have time to go and remake those. But you can see you turn one, and then at some point you switch over and you start going on the other one. And we can show that actually on the lathe here. So one thing on the lathe, when I made my very first lathe, and I was 14 or so, I used an old kitchen machine. And I basically put the kitchen machine, I put some nails around that I nailed it on my dad's workbench. He was very happy about that. <laughs> And I then used his mitre box, put a, um, a, a clamp on it, and then used a screwdriver that I sharpened up a little bit on the grindstone to grind some bits of wood out of the piece of wood that I screwed onto the kitchen machine. But I realized that that was not a lathe for me. It had to be between centers, so I then made some stuff and I made a block with a big bolt through it that I ground the tip to it and I made it into a lathe that actually could go between centers. Because to me, wood turning is between centers. And, and you will have noticed over the years that most of the stuff that I bring, or a lot of it, is between centers rather than 
faceplate stuff or, or chuck stuff and everything. Um, it's, you know, and I know there's a lot of people said, oh, but you know, real people, that's, there's enough people to do that. I don't also have to do that. I can do other stuff. It's like when I'm in a meeting at work and a number of times I have said, well, I don't see it that way. I say, well, that's good. Otherwise, I could fire you now. And because if we see it the same way, we don't need two people to do the same thing. Right? How, how good would a soccer team be with 11 goalies? You know, or, or with 11 strikers or so. It's, it's, it's not worth having. So anyway, that's how that one works. So to go between centers, you need one of these rotating bits on the other end, and then you can clamp the wood, and you can spin that, or you can use the motor. That's why there's a motor on this side. And then <coughs> to put the, wheel, the wood between it, I often kind of cheat, and I put the wood in the clamp and the chuck on one side, and put the pin on the other side. That holds it nice and steady. It also allows me that if I have an end that I actually want to round off, I can then carefully, slowly turn it in the end and sand it off at low speed while still holding it. Because if you have it truly between centers, of course, you can only hold it between the centers. But if we want to do off-center turning, we need proper centers. And there are several ways of doing that. One of them is to go for all the hassle, take the chuck off, and if you happen to have a Morse taper in there, which this one has, but my lathe at home doesn't. It's a solid uh, rod with a, with a thread on it. You can put a Morse taper drive center into it. Like that. The center point kind of figured out where the wood is going to center up on, and then those four grippy bits drive the wood around. Now, I haven't got one of these, so. I have one that looks almost the same. This one has a thread on the inside, the same thread as my lathe, which is a like a 17 turn per inch on a 7 8 <coughs> it, It's like a gas pipe thread. I don't know. It, it's an old Canadian lathe, what do they know? Um, but it seems to work. But so I can either take my chuck off, put this on, or, and that's actually much quicker, I simply open the chuck a bit, <coughs> clamp it in place, always tighten up both sides, and there's your drive center. Now this drive center grabs into the wood. There is another version, which is called a step set. So very similar, it is made to be put in the chuck, but on the front, the pin actually in the wood. It's retracts. It retracts. You can just, just push it in. Because it's flexible. And what you can see is instead of having these four big grippy points, it has a whole series of teeth. And the nice thing about that is that even if the wood is not quite sitting straight on there, get a piece of wood, it will still drive it round. It'll grab this the wood as it goes round. And if you get a catch, it'll kind of just grind through it a bit and not keep biting it and demolishing it. It'll just, um, it'll just slide out a little piece. Anyway, that's a stage setter. Now, one thing, of course, to realize with a stage setter is that if you try to push it into the wood, the pin is just going to come back. You need to kind of prepare the edge of your wood. And preparing the edge of the wood is always very important when you do off-center stuff. Because if, for instance, you're making a model of a car engine, and you need the crankshaft, you're going to actually need at least here, at least two, this, then three centers, where you're going to be turning it on. I've only turned the first two here. And these are 
parallel offset centers, like this one. Two axes marked out on the end, of course, so you know where they are. So similarly here, on the end of the wood, are marked out where these centers are. And then I can do a couple of things. One of them is I can use one of these that has a solid pin and hammer it in. And if you're worried that when you hammer it in that you might crack the wood, then you better throw away that piece of wood. <laughs> right? If you think that you're going to crack it by doing that, then I would suggest that you don't use that piece of wood for off-axis or eccentric turning, because then you're going to be in trouble. But, as we can see, it's actually in here, right? So this is now properly held. Of course, it falls off. So you realize that, at the same time, you will need a similar hole on the other side for the other pin to go in, to make sure that you hold that in place. So as I said, this one is the, um, a parallel offset. And it's a very different looking thing than the, um, uh, than the, the, the baseball pattern that you showed. So that's the kind of axis style that John uses when he makes his wine goblets. Where you've got an axis here and an axis there, but they are kind of still straight because you don't want to end up with a wine glass that is already pre-tipped, sort of where you pour wine and it all drops out. Apparently wine drinkers don't like that. Um, so that's when you get one of these. The next version of multi-axis is when you cross two axes. When you cross two axes, you then typically turn one side right up to the point where they cross, and then you keep going. So you turn, as you spin around one axis, like that. You turn one side only, and not the other side. And then you put it over the other side axis, and then you turn the other side. It's important to never go at the bit that you're not supposed to touch, because you don't see it. It uh, sits in mid-air. Um, you can look right through it when it's spinning. And the idea is that, like what I did here, you can see the axis crosses exactly where you get that interface point, and there's always a bit of sanding you have to do after that in order to get these two axes to properly match up. <coughs> but it's important that as you are turning this piece, you can see that the torso moves all the way around. And if you were to, by mistake, put your tool in here, you get a big couch in one side of the torso, and that wouldn't work so well. Audrey wouldn't like that either. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting. I made this as a trial piece because I was going to make this, so I just tried it out. I thought, okay, I'm going to just take a piece of, um, uh, what is it, hemlock or so, and um, measured it out, and I thought, I'm just going to turn this just to, just to see what the shape is like, and then I'll get a proper piece of wood to do it. But in the end, I thought, no, nah, that's probably good enough, and if I have two, they just kind of annoyed at each other. Right? So, uh, one of them going to look prettier than the other, or not, and, and, and it, I, it didn't work. Anyway, if you find, by the way, that you don't have a hammer in your toolbox, who does not have a hammer in a toolbox? Good. Even our satellites' toolboxes have a hammer in them. How big? And why is that? Uh, doesn't matter. Why is that? Um, a, because you just don't know, and B, without a hammer, it just ain't a toolbox. 
right? And there's always something that could do with a bit of judicious nudging into the right place. It is true, by the way, that um, like mallets, where you have a hammer with a piece of soft material on the front, I use those a lot to put satellites together, because certain things that go under a lot of tension, while you're tensioning them up, like a clamp band, a bit of strap that then gets blasted up with pyrotechnics once you're up in space. As you're tightening it up, it all stretches and gets in place. You have to keep tapping that all the way around to make sure it properly sets in place as you're doing that. So you just have to have a half. Because then you can hammer in the morning. And if it doesn't work, you get a bigger hammer. You can always, right, your hammer, you, what is it? Your hammer is never too big, but sometimes, you know, if you, at some point you can't lift it anymore. But even if you're like in Baikonur and, and, and the racing cars are a bit too close to your satellites, you know, it's like, oh, oh whoops, were you standing behind me, you know? <laughs> um, that's why you need a hammer. But in case, in case you just don't have it with you, I use one of these. So it's an old spade bit, and I turned a nice handle on it because that's the nice thing about being a wood turner. You can always make a handle for something. And then you can simply take your piece of wood, know where you want it to hold to be, and turn yourself a nice tapered hole. And this tapered hole is going to connect very nicely to this one. These ones are slightly less steep than this, which means they're going to grip on the outside where they are going to nicely, they're going to crush it a little bit, and once they set in, they really get a very nice mechanical fit on the wood exactly where you want it, because you can take this pin, get exactly what it, where you want it to be, you rotate it around, and you get a nice hole in it, and that is then your multi-axis starting point. Now here, of course, on this double axis point, and by the way, these are evenly spaced. They don't have to be evenly spaced. You can have them slightly tapered. Um, you can do all kinds of combinations of where these axes are to make those starting points to make sure what you're gonna do and then you can have those two points. Now, if there's two points, it is often easy because you could start here, you do there, you go here, you go there. Where it gets more tricky is if you want to make something like this, which is a swirl. It's a bit of a spiral turning because now, we have three axes. And as you're putting it up and you turn the first, you end up with a piece of wood that has some bits turned off and now you're trying to get the next one on. And if you then get the wrong two pieces connected, then you suddenly realize that you get one going this way and then one going that way and it's all gonna be very ugly. So that's why you then number them. One, two, three, one, two, three, in the order that you would like them. And this one, as it happens, is three. You can make four, five, three, you can make it as many as you like. Um, one, two, three, anti-clockwise. One, two, three, clockwise. Because you want them to rotate in the same way, and therefore, this one, two, three goes this way around, and of course, if you then look here, this one, two, three also goes this way around. Just so when I look at it, it looks anti-clockwise to me, and the other one is clockwise to me. But they do rotate in the same way. Just to remember that you want that rotation in the same way around, but when you look at it, it goes the other way. But it's always better to think about that before you start turning, and because well, when you've cut a piece of wood that sits off axis, it spins all over the place, and you have to go and see if you're gonna hit that, and see it somewhere in midair where it's whizzing out, and suddenly you start to touch the wood. Um, 
that is not the time when you want to think like, did I get the right positions or not? Let me just, right? So you want to just mark them out. And the reason that you can just mark them out clearly like that is, or one of the reasons, is that as you're turning, what you don't want to do is that when you're turning one axis and this piece of wood goes around like that, and actually let me just put it in a little. So, details. Anyway, so we've got this piece of wood here. And you'll realize that if I, now that I turned this one here, that's gonna spin all over the place, this one. You don't want to go anywhere near that with your tool. Unless, of course, in pure artistry, you said, no, 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 I wanted to make another little cut on there. <laughs> and I'm looking for exactly that, Just that you know, character. it's like, like the school teacher, you know, getting, getting the parents in. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, look at what your son is drawing. Really. Eyes do not go in the nose. I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Picasso, your son, really, go tell him to get his act together. <laughs> right? So, as we always say, you know, take your workshop, call it a studio, double your prices. Um, you're an artist, you can make what you like. And somebody may think it's ugly, and, and if you kind of got an idea together from that, that's what the value is. But what you can see here, is that there's a couple of things. You can see there's a lot of motion happening here that you don't want to be turning at, whereas this one, now that I've turned it, is nice and even. And I can then take this off, align it on the other one, and you can see that now it's this one that is nice and stable, and it's this one that moves around. If you wanted to make this a crankshaft for a car, you would now have to put holes exactly in the middle so that they both move around and then you can put the end of your shaft on here. One important thing that you can see here, for instance, if you turn this one, if you turn a bit too far while you're doing this, that drive point would disappear. Right, so if I had started out making this first one See, this one does go the right way around. I mean, who knows? If I'm turning this one, and I would then say, ah, yeah, let's turn, 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 and get right to the end. And it's not as if I've never done this. You then turn to the end, and then it's like, oh, whoops, because then your second drive point that you were going to use has vaporized. So number one, don't touch that, because you're going to lose your points where you want to go. The other thing to realize is that as you are clamping this in place on the second point now, I don't know if you can see that from the top, but you know, you're putting a lot of force like that. So you've got a flimsy piece of wood on the top here. So you always have to make sure that you have a substantial piece of wood left at the end. Which you can either do by leaving enough wood there, because if this is just a tiny little thing, it'll just break off, you can imagine, if you take a quarter inch of this wood, it just falls apart. What you can do is just glue a bit of plywood or so to it. And then use that for the cross fiber strength in order to do that turning on. So depending on how much of this you want to waste, and of course if it's a piece of Douglas fir, then it doesn't matter, but if you've got a fine piece of hardwood that you don't want to mess up too much, so you don't want to waste too much of that, just glue some bits of plywood to it, and then use those for your multi-axis turning to go around there. Um, another thing to realize, if you look for instance at this tool here, that little fire, pass that around. Just don't cut yourself with it. So I wore wood turners, you know, if you 
somebody here like is afraid of handling a scraper, then then you have to come in more often and learn more things. <laughs> yeah. So important things to realize is that you don't put these points typically right on the outside. Yeah. Because once you start turning a piece of wood on points that are completely on the outside, then with luck you get a pencil out of it, but all the other wood is gone. So get a tiny circle on one side, you know, with your one, two, three on it, and on the other side, those three points don't have to be at the same diameter. You can have a slightly bigger diameter, and that would make something like that slightly tapered. You can also, of course, go from one to one and have three axes that are simply in line with each other rather than having a twist to it. And then you would get a shape that when you look at the profile, you would simply get that shape out of it if you look from the top, but not having a twist in it, it'd just be a straight shape like that. And of course, if you are trying to make, um, for instance, pepper mills, I always wonder why people make pepper mills that are round. And I used to have a coffee grinder that was round. And boy, that was a pain until I realized that oh, I got a square coffee grinder. It is so much easier to hold. And a pepper grinder, why make it round? It is painful to hold that. Ugh. Make it like that profile. Or use four axes, and now it becomes like that if you turn it on to. Essentially, that axis, that make that sweep, this point makes that sweep. You know, if you turn around that one, this point makes that sweep, and this point will make this sweep. And between the four of them, you then get something that, for the inside where your mechanism go, makes no difference, but it is so much better to hold. And now you get an item that you can't buy in the store, because most stores, of course, have round ones, they're much more much easier to make when you do that. <coughs> By the way, one thing I forgot to say. At what age do most people start with wood turning? What? At what age do most people start with wood turning? Okay, wood turning is where the wood spins and there is a, like a, a steady knife that slices it off, right? Uh, Anybody been in kindergarten? <laughs> 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 yeah. Who of you has not done this yeah. at kindergarten? That's where the infection came from. So, anybody. Everybody is a wood turner, and everybody in the end really knows the meaning of the wood turner. It's the, it's, and I've, I've, I've said it before, right? The specific thing about wood turning is that, as compared to pretty much every other tool, it's the one where the wood moves and the cutter is steady, or it's a drill, or a saw, or a plane, or a sander, or a, everything goes the other way around. So it's a very specific thing. The other thing is, it is only one of two tools where you can take a piece of wood off the forest floor, get it onto your tool, and have a finished product by the time you're done with it on the tool. There's only one other tool that can do that, and therefore both this, the lathe, and the other tool have their own clubs. Whereas I don't believe there are bandsaw clubs around, <laughs> or planar clubs, or table saw clubs. Um, so which one is it? Some of you, of course, know. <laughs> and it's close to that, in a way. Um, it's a it's a, a, a whittling knife, right? A whittling knife. You can take a piece of wood from the forest floor, and carve yourself a wood spirit and be totally done. And there are whittling clubs around that do this. And it's this and the lathe where you can get a complete thing. Whereas if you're a woodworker, then you're going to need a, 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 a thing to plank it out, and then you need a planer, and a, and a jointer, and a sander, and a 
God knows everything in order to do just the simplest possible things. Dust collector. Oh, and, and a dust collector. Well, your lathe also needs a dust collector <laughs> in, in, in a way, but that, that's health and safety. I mean, that is like saying you need to eat before you can do work. Well, yeah, I suppose you need to breathe and all these kind of complicated things. But, um, but these are the, uh, the fun things that you're doing. So to just show what it means to turn off axis, if I take a simple piece here, I mean, how simple can you get? And I now put this in the lathe, and I go for a cross axis point. Now we'll see that this is spinning. And I can put a little marker on that says, actually, I'm just going to go half and half. Now, that's a bit, bit easy because I know where the middle is. And I am not going to get any closer than here. Um, depending on how much I'm going to take off. If what I'm going to take off is still well within that marker point, because basically I want to make sure that I have at least I don't know, a centimeter, half an inch, whatever, or so around that point. If it's hardwood, quarter inch will probably be enough to keep around there. Um, if you find that you've actually removed it by mistake, well, then go and glue that piece of plywood onto it and go to something else for a couple of hours and, and, and then go. Do make sure that you give it enough time to, to, to cure at that point. You know, because you're typically gluing on end grain, so get a good amount of glue on there so you don't starve that. And put a clamp on it. Um, make sure that that has properly cured. Because if you glue two planks together to get them through a planer or so, that's a nice big area and you're not loading it very much. But of course, if you have a piece of, uh, if you forgot your thing here and you have to glue an end piece to it, and now you're going to put it at the chuck here with lots of force on it, you want to make sure that this has had some time to cure it, that part of your, uh, of your lathe, that part of your, of your wood. So, so now we get close. What is always important is whenever you move this is to turn this quickly. And especially if you then go like, okay, I've turned my first one and I'm gonna change the axis and I'm gonna take the second one and then you go bang, right? And if you do it like this, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's not so bad. If you do the same thing like that, then you're probably gonna damage that fine piece that you just spent a couple hours trying to hone to perfection, and that is never as good. So now we've got this spinning here. We can now torque. Anybody does that when you put your wood on? Just hang on it for a bit, because if it then comes off, then you realize that it would have also come up when you hit that button. From there is that it can come up in any direction, and for some reason, the preferential direction tends to be roughly in the direction of your forehead. <laughs> and even though we trust ourselves completely, and we trust a piece of wood, and we trust how we put it on, right? Trust, but have additional stuff in place. Now, this is not a super duper. You got these ones with nice soft pads and everything else, but this is about the biggest wood I turn. I don't tend to put mega blocks on my lathe. This is a chisel that came off a set that probably cost me about $15 for six chisels. I got better ones, but what I just want to say is like, The difference between an expensive tool and a not so expensive tool is that you typically can get a sharper edge on the cheaper ones because they tend to be carbon steel rather than the, 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 the ceramic that you can, on a microscopic level, just not get quite as sharp. But they also blunt a bit quicker. 
But fundamentally, you're not going to get a better effect out of it. Right? It is not going to make any difference in, 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 in what comes out of it. It's like, you know, when you use a big mallet to go and do chiseling, and the more expensive mallet may sit better in the hand and be less tiring because of the vibration and everything, but it's not really going to make a difference to what your thing is going to look like. And I just wanted to show here that even if you have crappy tools, you can still do turnings. So now we're all set here. Now, I always start like that when I do anything offset or whatever. And of course, I'm only starting here, but by the time you're at this point, and you turn it up, it went a bit too far. You just got that little crack going in there as you forced it on, because you just turned. It's amazing how much force is in there. You have no idea how much force comes out of that. Do you ever use the drill press to push something out? You've been pushing it, and you couldn't get out. Oh, get on the drill press. And out of this. It's amazing how much force comes out of there. So, always just lean on it like that. It's just that if something then comes off, the bulk of it will be deflected off and hit this one first. And then, again, make sure that when you do that, it does that you catch your tool, and then hit your own switch. Now this says it's about a thousand RPM. Um, my lathe has a motor and it's got like a couple of little step pulleys for the V-belt. So I can go faster or slower. I have no idea how fast they go. But you can also see here that there is some in the middle, there's not a lot of motion, but there is some because it's still square. And on the outside, of course, there's a lot more. So, and you don't want to be turning on the end, because well, I want to keep that solid. I can take a little bit off just to get the sharp edges off, because it's typically wasted anyway. So on here, if this is rounded off a little bit, that's okay. But it is not like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to go like that, because then your other point is gone. So I'm going to take a little bit off here. And you just go in until you can hear it. And you move it sideways. And you're absolutely not riding the bevel or so. You see? That's what you get when you get a cut. That's what happened with stage center. That's the nice thing about a stage center, it just turns. And then you want to mic it tight it up. Tiny little bit to make sure that it grips again properly, but if you catch, it just stops it from moving a bit. The way I treat cutting like this, and as you can see here, not much has happened on the back, but on the one side we're starting to get a nice groove into it, is I always imagine that the wood is not actually turning and that I'm simply gouging away into it. And as I gouge into it, that automatically makes me realize that you don't take the chisel like that and get it into the wood. But if I go like that, and I hope that it's going to take off, it's just going to go smack, 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 and take large pieces of fibers off, and probably rip bit right up to the other end. 
which is what I don't want. Whereas if I hold it sideways, it's going to slice through it. And it's going to slide through the fibers nicely and take them out. And as I work my way into the wood as it turns, it slices those fibers out of the way instead of hacking them out of the way. Similarly, if, I, if this was a knife, if I wanted to cut this, I would go like that. I wouldn't go and say, oh, you know, oof, I can't get through the plank somehow, because I know that's not going to work. You have to slice in the direction of the knife shot here, because the cutting edge runs this way around. I make sure that that goes in the direction that the wood fibers move, so I get the nice slicing action coming along as I'm going there. So I'm going to... a little bit. And of course you have to have your hand solidly on the rest here, because this whole thing, you're kind of moving it in mid-air to touch the wood. It's not as if you kind of bring it up to a round piece and then kind of hacking in, you know, kind of start slicing into it. You just have to hope that somewhere in mid-air you're touching it. And then the other thing is that you don't want to get beyond the line that you put in there. And here I'm cutting on the top part of the chisel. That top bit here, which is almost vertical when I'm cutting. And then you get the bottom bit that's curved a bit more, and that then cuts off the rest of the bits of the, of the, of the wood fiber and gets them out of the way. You see now that the big corners have kind of disappeared and start to cut a little bit more and the ball. And of course, as you know, never cut uphill. Always cut into the wood like that. Never go around and try to cut this way because it'll just catch. from this side, that side, this side, that side, to keep going around, okay. work your way into the center. And now, we have to stop again, so I can see what it starts to look like. So, this almost just looks like a regular turning now. See, I've, I've come all the way in it. It's all nice and round. I just have to get now, go a little bit closer to my point here, but without taking any of the other side off. Right? I want to get to this line, finish it off, but I don't want to go round it in there, because now I'd be taking stuff off the other side that I might still need in my second setting. So, I'm going to first cut this pipe here, and of course these are small cuts, so I'm now going to use the edge here as a scraper. To get into the corner. So if I hold this flat, this just becomes the scraper, that corner. But because I'm now cutting into wood that is already round, and I'm not testing those big corners of the square wood where it would be taking out big fibers. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
describing here because my lace switch is down here. So it's automatic. But you always know where your switch is and it's there, but now it's in PDF. Right, so now I've got a nice sharp end point here where it's going to connect into the other side. So I'm going to take it off. And of course, I can now do three things. I can now either put it on a parallel axis. Or I can use it on the other parallel axis. Or, that's all it's going to do, is put it on the pure cross axis. So now you can see this is moving around differently than it was before. This piece that I'm not going to be turning is also just wildly moving around. And that's then the bit that I'm not going to get into action. What you can see here is that because my starting points were quite close together, and because I've left this fairly thick, not like John's you know, wine glass that wants a nice thin stem, I am still, if you look at it from the top, you know, the top view here, um, this is still in line with the force of the wood. So the, 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 the line between the two points is still inside the wood. So I'm pretty, pretty steady, pretty solid. And now I've, I've played with this, so make sure that you rotate it by hand, to make sure that you're not going to hit your tool wrist. Hold the thing in place, get your tool on there. And now we're going to do the same on this side. So you can see that this face here that I've turned nice, nice and straight is not straight at all anymore. Now it's just moving all over the place. And I've also had to be careful that I don't go and cut into this other side because this end here that you can see is moving all over the place. You don't want to get in there with it. So going in here, I'm holding the whole thing steady with you know good grip on this front piece. And again, cutting like that on that top piece of the chisel, which is almost vertical, slice into those corner fibers. turning very fast and out of the eyes oh, you always turn as fast as possible because that turns quicker but to me that feels like I'm going for a walk in nature but if I take my bicycle I could do it in half the time <laughs> right no I wanted to go for an hour walk in nature so I don't want to do it in half the time and going faster that may be quicker it also makes any errors bigger, quicker. And you have less control of your to actually Now, that cross point is where the two are going to match up is always going to be an interesting one because they are basically those two end sections intersect, those two ring sections have an intersection that is on the two axis, and you just cannot turn it completely. So at some point, you have to then take it off, see what you're doing. You can see I'm still getting a bit smaller here. They're not quite matching up yet. But especially if it's trying to overhang the old one. Yes, uh, so look, you look at the outer profile of where you can see the outer profile moving around and don't go beyond that for the new profile. Thank you. 
So now we can see here in the meantime that on the one hand, on one side, there's a nice feeding in between the two. This one is going to need some work, but that I can't turn this any further. Because if I turn this any further off, then I'm going to cut into here and I'm going to lose the, this side. So whatever I fix here, I could do it here. So this is, in the end, that's where the hand sander comes out. Or the Dremel or the you know, sanding drum on your base that you can use that to fix those last bits and pieces that come in there. When do you do your sanding? You do it as you finish each segment, you sand it? And no, it's typically just afterwards. Once the whole thing is done, then you get the sanding drum out and start to sand the whole thing in, in, in and feed all those, smooth all those edges over on, on, on where they come so together. You don't sand it on the lathe then? No, no, because that's like turning on the lathe. Whatever you sand off here is, is going to then damage the one on the other side. That's already good. Not even some rough sanding? Alright, just wondering. This is rough sanding with a, with a one grit yeah. piece of sandpaper, right? Um, so if I turn a bit more here to get the effect. in England, a neighbor of mine was a production turner for spindle stuff, and he would turn a lot of chairs, Windsor chairs, and the way he made those spindles was that he had a big motor to get very nice steady to so really hit those bits of wood with enormous force and cut very quickly, and then he had a clutch, so he didn't have to switch the motor off, you could just push a big button or a big pedal that removed the drive wheel with a clutch from the chuck and it also then pulled back the whole thing. So stop turning, pull out and you could just go grab it, twist the big handle, take it out, put the little piece of wood in, let it go and go. And because it was an enormous thing, he could really hit it with a big pull, but that would take forever to slow down because there was just so much mass of a really big motor that would take forever to stop. And he didn't have to stop it, he just disconnected the drive and he could whiz it out, get the new piece of wood in, and then so push, 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 and then he just go on. He almost got one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and he'd have, you know, all those columns for some, uh, you know, stairs or chairs or, or, or a balustrade or whatever that we could just go and whiz out as much as possible. But again, I'm not a production turner. The only time I do anything production turners is on a really small lathe. So here I'm just turning whatever shape, right? I'm not going for anything particular. You know, the life of an artist. the two effects here that feed into each other. I don't see it so much, I would have to turn a bit more to get that slightly clear again to hold that. But then this end piece here, you would then sand out or dremel out. If I were to cut this a little bit further, 
I would immediately start the undercut on this side. So then I would have to sand a bit less here, but now also have to sand on this side. So in the end, it doesn't make any difference on where you're going to be sanding um, in order to make that, that, that offset piece correct. You can also leave a big lump between them and then go and dremel that in some shape. You can see that this is, of course, turned. As I turned this one, I made this round, but here there wasn't anything to go round. But similarly, when I turned this one, that piece round, and there wasn't anything here to get round. Um, to get these, 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 these various shapes in there. Um, where's my other one? So the triangular shape, or the twisty shape, show one of these. The thing is, on this one, on a cross shape, is that the axes don't cross each other. And you can see that on the uh, on that tool handle, come back here, that there is no point where, or the intersection of the two of the axes is actually on the on the curve. That's where they intersect, rather than what you get in these cross axes, where you get an intersection in the middle, where you then have to deal with that. Whereas on the end, you want that curve to be the that that line on the on the outside one that you have here you want that to be visible you're not going to sand that away and you can you can sand it all nice and round again afterwards after all that's what wood turners do we take stuff that is square and make it round and then here we go in a way not what wood turners do because it is round and we're keeping it round or it's so square, we're keeping it not square. So this hole here, this tip is a little bit small for the size of the hole, so I'm going to use my other drive here. Go a slightly bigger point. And I, I look carefully, I start with number one here. And number one on this side, and number one on that side. So, because the pips are fairly small together, fairly close together. I can now go and take the whole piece of the top. Because I know I'm not going to go anywhere close to Pretty. As you're moving along, don't cut like that because you always go like that when you do that. Right, like you stand here and you move using your legs. So that the whole position of your upper body, your arms, and everything stays the same. Because you're cutting in midair, you're not having any boot for any guidance. The only guidance you have is your tool rest that you're sliding along. And then in midair, you now go along and see what it is like. And now, if we stop this, we can see here that we're starting to shape the two ends of the wood. But I would want to make sure that I'm at least still about in the middle. When I get this, I still want to go right to the other end. So. Of course, another thing with eccentric turning, normally in wood turning, if you start with a square 
blank, you can turn roughly to the size of the square part. I mean, it gets smaller because all the corners disappear. With eccentric turning, it gets a whole lot smaller again because every axis defines you know, the smallest area, so you end up with something half the size. So it's it. Whatever you end up with is always quite a bit smaller than your initial contribution. But now you'd almost think you're turning a regular piece of wood. But it really doesn't look much like anything in particular. But if you switch it off, you realize that it doesn't look anything like a regular piece of wood. Now, what you can do is here just take it off, get the next number in, and then go back to the first one if you, if you need to be. So I'm now going to go for number two. And I'm going to go, as you see here, I'm going to grab number two on this side. As you can see, I'm already a little bit close on the edge here because I cut right to the end. But I want to make like a handle. You can see it's a bit close, but it's still gripping. So it's still good. On this side, the pins are much closer together. So here I'm, I'm good anyway. Um, this one is actually held on those four grippers. They take the force. Whereas on this side, because it's only the width of this edge of this, this pin that holds that, you need more wood around it because there's a lot of sideways force. Whereas here, it's end force, this one has got this width force. So this is the one where you want to make sure that you've got the most wood around your drive pins. See? That piece of wood that looks almost round, like any old bit now that I've taken the next axis, it's starting again entirely being wildly moving around. Now I've got to go in the mid-air again. And as you go in, and it starts to cut. Don't just keep cutting further, further, further in. Once you cut a little bit, then you go sideways. And do the rest of that cut. A demo piece. So you can see it's worth looking at here to say, okay, where am I actually cutting? And you can see that that's the facet I'm cutting. And you see this facet is pretty much done once that I was cutting here. This one is not the one I was cutting. So now I go to number three. Find number three here. Let's find number three up here. And again, I've come from something that looks just nice and round to something that just wildly flaming, wildly flaming. You know, screen there. 
go and find my mid-air point. Larger, heavier tool, wider tool as well, reduce some of this vibration that you're getting and make it easier? Um, well, you mean a big cutter? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, possibly. Um, but because you're, you're, you're kind of hitting the edges here, I don't like using a, um, like a roughing gouge on it, where you just go and because with the roughing gouge, as you have a square piece and you hit it with the roughing gouge and you smack this off, often you don't really care if you throw the splinter off because it's all going to go. But here you're cutting down to this end because you want a spiral piece of this side, but you don't want to throw the splinter off because on this side you're sitting on the other end. So you want that slicing action, which is slightly slower. But here we are starting to get the complete shape in there now. So again, this is the one that I'm going on. You can see here that I still have this brown piece that is of what I'm supposedly cutting now. So I'm going to take another cut here. This one, by the way, you can sand, but if you want to sand this, then you must use a board. So, I didn't bring any sandpaper, but you can just imagine that if you go like that, that's how you want to sand it, so that you do not remove that line that is between these edges. Um, if you were to put a piece of sandpaper over it, it would just round it all off again and you would get rid of all the effect. So we've never done that before, right? To get something really nice and straight and then I'll be the sanding and oh whoops, you know. Or if you're sanding this end, you forgot that the other end of your sandpaper was touching the edge of your of your of your nice bowl and that's that kind of then demolish it. So So I can see that here I'm good. Um, but this one, you can see there's a little bit of the brown left, so what I can do there is, that was number two. Can't really read it so well anymore here. That's number two. Too complicated. Anyway, here you can see that you got this kind of twisty handle, and then you can take the end, sand it off a little bit, and turn that into. Are, do you, do you uh, turn at different speeds for 
multi-axis versus single axis? I, I turn no faster than this. Okay, very slowly. Quite slowly, you want to make sure you cut and um, because it is just flying all over the place and, and chances of stuff flying off are just a bit bigger and you don't want to also add a lot of rotational energy to it. That, 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 that wood also there. It, it depends on the wood, you know, if, it, if it's a solid piece of hardwood, if you've got some wood glued solidly on the end, you know, across hardwood. I don't know, the peanut gallery is always painful. Um, how are we doing time wise? It is 11 o'clock. Hmm? Pretty much time. Pretty much time. Good. Any questions here that anybody has about what to think about for? Because obviously it, it's it's a protest a process that you want to just try it yourself and then try to make things and try to figure out how you get this um, that join and how to deal with that. Yes. Are we going to post some kind of visualization of you know diagrams and examples from those different counties? Um, I can sketch up some stuff. Sure. Yeah, but it's, you know, like how to do one of these and find the people, find the center points. And like what I did here is you put a ruler on it, say, yeah, that's about the center line of that. And that then gets you those endpoints that you mark out on the piece of wood. Um, like on the bottom one, you can still see the holes that I used to align the axis on. You can see that one of them aligns with that axis, and another one aligns with this axis and with that axis. Um, you can also see that where they join together, there's a bit some sanding, there's still a little bit of stuff visible where the two, you know, how the two meet is, is, is always a bit of a compromise because they're not no longer circular. Right, it's, it's, it's a cut through a circle which becomes an ellipse and they're meeting and they will never meet properly. I have a question, do you ever combine off axis with on axis turn? Um, well, in a way, if you, if you make something like this, you can then also have two center points and get the middle piece in the middle. You can have as many axes as you like. Um, in, in true crankshafts, there would yeah. be a bushing yeah. in the middle. In the middle and on the ends, yeah. there would be the, the on axis part. Yeah. You did a lot of work.